Hi St Paul's, my name is Kat, I'm part of St Paul's at 5pm. One thing I love about church is that we get to ride with each other through the highs and lows of life. Um, we get to rejoice in the successes, um, we get to mourn and lament the disappointments of life. Um, and that, yeah, we're genuinely family um, who get to be together as we get to know God more and more. Hi, we're the Loveland family. I'm Colleen. And I'm Dave. What I love about St Paul's is the good, solid teaching about Jesus and, and this solid fellowship that we have at church. And I love to sing in church. It's something I love to do. Hi St Paul's, I'm Miriam. I'm David. One thing I love about our church is that we're rooted in God's word and that we haven't given up meeting together and encouraging each other even while we have to meet online. One thing I love about our church is that we're a church for all people from all sorts of places and all walks of life. Hey, 5pm. Welcome to church tonight here at St Paul's in Canterbury, online of course. We are glad to have you with us. We're a church for everybody, all people, and um, we're going to do some great stuff tonight. I'm really looking forward to this evening. We are going to have another instalment of our friend Bop joining us. He's invited me in this week to help him on the great search party for comfort. We're going to hear from one of our members, Kate, about some new stuff that's happening in the mission partner space. And we're going to hear from our student minister, Steve Driscoll, from Isaiah 42. It's going to be a great evening. If you're coming by for the first time, we'd love to know that you are joining us. You can put a comment in the section below the video and you might want to pop in for supper in one of the, the Zoom get-togethers. Uh, so, friends, enjoy church. I'm going to encourage us with Psalm 100 as we head in to do church. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let's join together from our homes and sing for joy to the Lord.
Alright, well, I'll just wait. Pops invited me to come and... Oh, oh, it's so good to see you. I am ready to join you on the great search party for comfort. Yay! Mm -hmm. Well, I spent the last few weeks getting nice and active, doing some Creed aerobics, so I think I'm mm -hmm. fighting fit and ready to join the great search party. But first of all, Bob, what are you holding? Oh, well, this week I was having a nap in here. I heard Steve D. Just in the sermon. He said we can just on. So I got this duster so we can go and- Bob, 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 I think you misheard again. It's the, a different Steve, but the same problem. He didn't say we can dust go. No? He said we can trust go. Oh. Uh. I'll help us in just a moment, but Bob, I wanted to ask you, how do you get to school every day, Bob? I catch the bus to school every day, and I sit with my friend Camel. Camel is the funniest. He does the funniest jokes on the way to school every day, and they are so good. Thanks, Bob. We probably could have just stopped at the bus. Would have been fine, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, so you get on the bus every day to go to school, and on your way to school, you actually are trusting in a lot of things. Yeah. You're trusting when you step on the bus that's going to get you to school on time. You're trusting mm -hmm. when the bus drives down the road and they're going to drive safely. The bus isn't going to explode. And it's good to trust in that because the bus has shown you every day that it can be trusted, right, Bob? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we see that we can trust God. Now, Bob, do you know what these are? They are binoculars. I use them when I go walking with my grandpa to look at all the birds. I love looking that, at That's right, Bob. I just... <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Mm -hmm. These are binoculars. Uh, they help you to see something really clearly. Often something that's far away. Well, the Bible tells us that looking around the world is kind of like looking at binoculars. They help you see something really clearly. They help you see that God is powerful. Bob, can you think of something that God has made? God made all the flowers and all the cool petals. He made all the stars. Do you know that stars are just floating balls of gas in the universe? And he made all the people. That's, that, that's very true, Bob. God made all of those things. And as we look at those things, we can remember God who made them. As we look at flowers and see how beautiful and intricate they are, we can remember that God made that. Even as we breathe, we can remember that God put the breath in our lungs because God is powerful. There is nothing too big for him. But Bob, in the book of Isaiah, God also makes some big promises that show he can be trusted. Wow. He makes a big promise about somebody who's going to come. Someone who will make blind people see again who will make the best news ever, that we can be friends with God, go everywhere on the earth, and who will make all the wrong things right again. Bob, can you think of who that might be? Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus? <laughs> That's right, Bob, it is Jesus. Wow. And God's sent Jesus to make those promises come true. All those promises, can you think about when Jesus made a blind person see, mm -hmm. yep. and when Jesus sent his friends out to go tell everyone on earth about the best news ever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he made some of the biggest wrong things right, when he beat sin forever. But, Bob, is every wrong thing right now? No. <clears throat> no, there's still lots of bad things out in the world. That's because God's plan and God's promises aren't done yet. So we can trust that God's promises are going to come true because he's shown us already that he is powerful, there's nothing too big for him to do, but also that he will come through on his promises. I think that's the best ever. Our friends are gonna hear from Steve Driscoll in just a moment <sighs> about that more. So why don't we say goodbye to them for now? Goodbye. <laughs> say goodbye. Goodbye. And we'll see you guys next week. Welcome to Church in the Graveyard and everyone uh, at home. Uh, let's welcome Kate. Kate's here today to share a little bit, little bit about the work she's been doing as part of our parish council. Uh, so Kate, you've been on parish council for a couple of years and this year we've started a mission partnership team. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, how and why that came about? Sure. Um, it came about as part of a process of parish council trying to work out how we can be most effective at serving church well. Um, and part of that was to set up some little um, mini tasks groups 
Um, and they were around key areas that we want to be able to focus on as a parish council. And of course, mission is one of those key areas. Uh, we want to keep that high on the agenda and have good decision-making processes for how we support mission uh, beyond Canterbury and Hurlston Park, across Australia and across the world. Let's drill down into that a little bit more, Kate. Tell us um, really concretely, what, what sort of things does the Mission Partnership Team do? Sure. And the first thing that we did was to uh, create a Mission Partnership Policy. And this is to help guide Parish Council on the decisions about Mission Partnerships. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a variety of different kinds of partnerships, um, that it's ministry here in Australia, that we're supporting ministry around the world as well. Um, and, uh, and we want to have some guidelines around how many partnerships we think we can realistically, um, financially and prayerfully support as a church. Um, the next thing that we do is to kind of make some recommendations to Parish Council about those partnerships. So when someone comes to us asking that we support them, we go through a process to review um, their mission and what they're going to do, see how it fits within our policy and uh, make some recommendations to Parish Council. And on that, you, on behalf of the Mission Partnership team, have some exciting news today. Yeah, really exciting news. So the first thing is that we have taken on Sally as a mission partner, and we're really excited to be able to support her financially and prayerfully, uh, particularly as she works out what the next year looks like and the future um, of mission for her. Um, and the second thing is that um, as Kirsten and Bernays support has, uh, finishes up in June, we are taking on uh, some new CMS partners, um, Marty and Katrina Feltham, who are serving in a theological college in Nairobi. That's fantastic news and great to see um, the Mission Partnership team already achieving things, expanding our commitment to supporting mission. Um, Claire and I caught up with Sal last night uh, and she's really excited to be able to come and share some more in the coming weeks uh, with our whole church family, so look forward to that. For now, why don't I pray and commit the work of the Mission Partnership team into God's hands and then, Kate, you're going to read the scriptures. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we um, do commit into your hands and your care and keeping the work of the Mission Partnership team. We pray that you would work through them and in them um, to expand our commitment to supporting mission uh, locally and abroad uh, for the cause of the gospel. And so now we pray, Father, as we read the scriptures, as Kate reads them uh, to us, that you would fill our hearts with your spirit, giving us all wisdom and insight that we might know Jesus more. Amen. I'm reading from Isaiah 42 and starting at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teachings, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. I hope you're going well. Let's pray and look at Isaiah 42 together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would show us today that you deserve our trust. I pray that you would particularly show that to those who are struggling to trust you. Amen. Well, predicting the future is very, very difficult. Uh, the last few months have definitely caught me by surprise. I think they've probably caught most people by surprise. I wanted to see if anyone had predicted this crazy, crazy year in advance. So I went back and I read some astrology columns from January 2020. I wanted to see if 2020 caught the astrologers by surprise. And in conclusion, yes, it did. Uh, the astrologers had no idea what was coming. Uh, if you don't know, astrology is the science of predicting the future based on the positions of the stars in the sky. In January, the astrology column said that Aquarius's 
should dream big but be considerate. Our Tauruses were advised to ask for a raise or a promotion this quarter, a very brave move in a recession. Uh, Leos should be on the lookout for fresh new experiences. Uh, and I guess that means being locked in a house for two months. But none of the columns I read talked about social distancing. None of them talked about homeschooling or working from home. None of them talked about unemployment or mounting debts. None of them talked about people passing away in nursing homes. The core issues that we have faced across the world in 2020 are completely missing from the astrology columns. Predicting the future is very, very difficult to do. I personally remember letting out a sigh of relief when the bushfire season finished. I remember thinking, great, we can go back to normal now. Predicting the future is incredibly difficult and I wish it wasn't so. I don't know about you, but I wish I had more control. I would like to know what June is gonna look like. I'd like to know what the job market is gonna look like in 2021. I would like to be able to plan ahead and think ahead. And so I'm tempted to trust anyone that can pretend to know what it's gonna be like. I'd love to know what 2030 is gonna look like, what 2040, what 2050. There's plenty of people willing to guess what it's gonna look like, but who can we trust? Who is there that really knows the future? Who is there that can make predictions that actually come true? We're gonna to see today that God is the only one with complete knowledge of the future. We aren't in control all the time, but He is. He's in control of the future and He's in control of your future. We're gonna study Isaiah 42 today, but I wanna show you the backdrop to Isaiah 42 first so I can set it in a bit of context. And I want you to know that Israel desperately wanted to know the future. They wanted to know whether they would be annihilated or whether they would prosper. They wanted to know whether the rain would come or stay away. They wanted to have more control than they had and so they turned to idols. Uh, Israel worshipped little mini gods that they could see and touch and control and they worshipped these idols hoping that the idols would give them direction about the future. Now Isaiah 41 just slams those idols. In verses 22 and 23, God challenges the idols and says they cannot predict the future. And so he says that they are nothing and their work is less than nothing. None of them are worth your trust. Uh, verse 28 says that there is no counselor, no one who gives an answer. Behold, they are all a delusion. They are empty wind. Now the backdrop to Isaiah 42 is the idolatry of Israel. And I just want to ask, before we get into 42, I just want to ask what idols you are clinging to in your own life. What are you trusting in? What's giving you your sense of safety? There is nothing that's up to the job. Now, maybe astrology columns aren't your thing. Maybe you like to read the opinion section of the newspaper. How many editorials in 2019 predicted how 2020 would be? How many books? How many podcasts? Predicting the future is very, very difficult. Now, it's in this context of false predictions and idolatry that Isaiah chapter 42 appears. And I really wanted to set that backdrop because Isaiah 42 is a famous Christian passage. And sometimes we Christians can take famous Christian passages and stick them on our coffee cups or do weekend away jumpers or memory verses and we can lose the context in which they appear. The context is when you are sick to death of untrustworthy prophets, when you're sick of dumb idols, when you're sick of the future taking you by surprise and messing up your life, when you're just sick of it. Isaiah 42 verse 1, Behold, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. In Isaiah 42, God makes a prediction. We might not read it that way, we might not think about it that way, but that's what's happening in verse 1. It's a prediction by God about the future. It's a prediction from someone trustworthy, and it's a prediction full of hope. Now, most of the astrology predictions I read out were pretty vague. If you're a Capricorn, good on you. You display a mature, confident personality, and because the sun has apparently created a harmonious configuration with the planet Saturn, I quote, someone you love may inspire you to use your skills in 2020. Just think about how vague that prediction is. Someone you love 
may inspire you to use your skills in 2020. They may, or they may not. They might, they might not. When God makes this prediction of the servant in Isaiah, he doesn't hedge his bets. This is the first of what Christians have traditionally called the servant songs in Isaiah, and they are four sets of predictions about this servant growing and growing in details. God doesn't hedge his bets. He spotlights exactly what's going to happen. Uh, verse 1 again in the ESV says, Behold my servant. In the NIV it says, Here is my servant. It's an attention-grabbing opening. Now we don't use the word behold very often in Australia. In Australia we tend to use the word hey. We tend to say hey or hey you. If someone's running off with 60 rolls of toilet paper at the supermarket, you probably wouldn't yell out, behold. You would yell, hey, hey you, stop it. Now, this passage starts with a word a little bit like hey. It grabs your attention and it tells you to focus on the servant. And then it fills out the picture of what the servant is going to be like. And in verse 1, Isaiah says that the servant is a guy who is filled with the Spirit of God, chosen by God, loved by God, and his mission from God is to bring justice to an unjust world. Verse 2 says he's not going to cry aloud or lift up his, ver his voice. Uh, if you've read much Old Testament, Israel repeatedly cries out and lifts up their voice to the Lord when they need rescue from Egypt or some enemy. The servant isn't going to cry out for rescue because he's providing the rescue. He's not howling outside in the street. And a voice th verse 3 says that he's gentle. Uh, he's not going to break a bruised reed or put out a wick that's almost out. I don't know about you. I don't know how you feel when there's only one Tim Tam left in the pack or when a candle is burnt right down to the bottom, you just want to put it out of its misery. But the servant of God is so gentle that he's not in the business of putting out faintly burning wicks. When you have a person at their wits end, he values them. He thinks there's life in them. He doesn't want to snuff them out. The powerful in our world are often not gentle and the gentle in our world are often not powerful. But God is predicting that he will send a servant who is both powerful and gentle. And then verse 4 says that he will not grow faint or be discouraged. He comforts the faint, but he isn't faint himself. And to complete our picture, it says that the islands wait for his Lord. Now, the islands were the great beyond for Israel. And the point is, if justice has made it all the way out to the Mediterranean, then justice has swept through everywhere else on the way. If justice has reached Tasmania, then justice has passed through Canterbury and the inner west. This is the servant that God predicts in Isaiah 42. God predicts a coming servant who will bring justice out to the world. Now justice is such a key theme here. Tell me maybe in the, in the Zoom chat afterwards how often justice is mentioned in the first four verses. Justice is a key theme and that's so relevant here because this pandemic feels particularly unjust. It isn't just that a business in Campsie goes broke because a virus broke out in Wuhan. It's unjust that a grandmother in Milan dies separate from her husband because a, a young man at the park didn't keep his distance. It's unjust that medical personnel are losing their lives, trying to save lives. I don't know how you're coping personally with the unjust nature of this thing. I think that some people can be, can be a bit like cooking pots. I don't know if you have a bubbling, burning anger about all this or if you have a, a kind of gently simmering resentment. And my wife has asked me a few times, um, who's going to be made to pay for all this? Is there going to be a big international trial where a guilty party is brought up and we all agree that justice is done? Probably not. It's frustrating that the world is so unjust and Israel would have felt the same. And God says to them, don't put your faith in idols. Don't pay attention to the astrologers. It's fine that you're angry about injustice. I'm sending someone, I'm sending my servant, and justice will pour out of him. And of course, there is going to be a trial where the guilty are punished for this disaster. There is going to be a trial, but it won't be a human trial. It'll be a trial by the servant of God at the judgment seat of God, and you will be held accountable too. So cling to this gentle servant who won't put out a smouldering wick, who won't break a bruised reed. He will bring justice. And verse 8 and 9 close our section. Let's read them together. Verse 8. 
I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. I hope you can see that this passage really is about God predicting the future. The idols can't predict the future. We shouldn't worship them. But God does declare things before they spring into being. And if this is a prediction, then it's our duty to figure out who it is predicting. Who is the servant that will come and be gentle but firm? Who won't cry out when he's suffering? Who will bring justice not just to Israel but to the island, the Gentiles? Who is this servant? Well, a friend of mine went to a Jewish Bible study once and they were looking at this, this passage and some other servant songs and they started talking about who they thought the servant was. Now, they tossed around options and they tried everything, but none fit all of the predictions about the servant in Isaiah. So something incredible happened. The leader of the Jewish study group chimed in and said that the prediction of the servant must be about Jesus of Nazareth. He said that as a Jew, Jesus was the only person that fit all of the servant passages in Isaiah. It was an astonishing moment. And then he said that because all the predictions were about Jesus, and that doesn't make sense because he wasn't born yet, Isaiah must have been written later. He was forced to conclude that these bits of Isaiah were written hundreds of years later than anyone thought. He had to conclude that they were written after the life of Jesus by early Christians. They predict Jesus too well to have been written beforehand. Now, unfortunately for that view, we now know for certain that this was written before Jesus was born because we've dated scrolls of this chapter of Isaiah to hundreds of years before Christ. The Dead Sea Scrolls proved with scientific precision that this was written before Christ. As verse 9 says, God is in the business of predicting the future, of predicting things before they've happened. So we can have confidence in him and in his plan. Jesus is the servant, the chosen one of God, who will bring gentle justice to the world. And the world is very unjust sometimes. I don't know what you're going through at the moment personally, and it's hard for me to even find out because I can't see you and I can't talk to you. If it feels to you like this is just too hard at the moment, and you can't control things and life's a mess, that's right. Life is a mess. And you can't control everything. You can't rely on your strength and your confidence all the time. And sometimes that's not enough. But you can trust God and you can rely on him. God has put his number one man on the job of putting the world to rights. Jesus is at work bringing justice to an unjust world. And there will be a day of reckoning. People will be held accountable. The secrets will be exposed. It looks like injustice will have the final word. Word. So trust that God is in control of history. The astrologers, the idols, the opinion writers, they cannot tell you what the future will look like. But God can. And this is the prediction about the future that you need to know. Jesus will come and he will bring justice. And so Christians for 2,000 years have said a particular prayer. Uh, in Greek, Maranatha. In English, for 2,000 years, Christians have said, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray that prayer now. Dear God, please come and bring justice. Give us the will to trust you when the world seems unjust. Instead of planting our confidence in anything else, help us to be rooted in you. Help us to know that you have control of the future. Amen.
Hi everyone, my name's Rani and I'm going to lead us in prayer. So if you'd like to join me, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to thank you that you are the God who comforts your people. And now in particular, we're so thankful that that's who you are, because comfort is the thing that we're all longing for, and it's the thing that we need. Father, thank you that your comfort is real and specific, that we find it in the gentle and strong person of your son, in his death and resurrection that bring true release from sin and darkness, for the way that he has taken us by the hand to lead us into life with you. Father, we confess that we often look elsewhere for comfort, but we ask that this week you would lead each of us to find true and lasting comfort in you. Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort to the world. We continue to ask that that might come in the form of containment of the virus globally and a swift vaccine and in many people coming to know Jesus. We pray for those in special need of comfort in Australia and bring before you those in unsafe homes, those in detention, in aged care, those who are sick, and those under financial strain. Lord, we particularly cry out to you in anger and sadness at the racism currently felt among the different Asian communities in Australia. Lord, we ask that you would bring true repentance and restoration now, and we look in hope to your promise that one day you will bring justice to the nations. We also look to the nations around the world and ask that you would be working even in these strange times to open eyes that are blind to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that you would strengthen them to live and speak as ambassadors for Jesus, the light of the world. And we pray especially for those who have never heard that good news, that you would graciously reveal yourself to them and that even now you would be raising up people to go to them once restrictions are lifted. Finally, God, we really thank you for our church family here at St Paul's and for the real fellowship that you have gifted us by your spirit. We pray particularly during this time of change that you would help us to look to you, our creator, who gives life and breath for all our needs. We ask that you would continue to bless those who shepherd us with great wisdom as they lead us into the seasons ahead. And Lord, we ask that you would help each of us to love and serve you and our neighbour and to press on with our hope in Jesus. Lord, we look to you for all these things and thank you for the comfort of knowing that you hear our prayers and are gracious and powerful to answer. And we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We really loved having you with us in this space. If this is your first time, we would love to connect with you. There are lots of friendly faces on our Zoom rooms. The links are below. If you want to get connected, just send us a message on whatever platform you've joined us on. Final blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this week. Amen.